From New York City, the makers of Clipper Craft Clothes for Men and 1036 leading retail stores from coast to coast present the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> This week's adventure, A Case of Identity. Well, here we are, as usual, about to pay our weekly respects to our favorite rock and tour, the good Dr. Watson. What about tonight's story, Doctor? Well, tonight I have prepared a little challenge for you and our radio friends. Yes, the story I'm going to tell is one of Holmes' more mental adventures. It has its bizarre moments, of course, but still, all in all, its solution is fairly obvious. As you know, Holmes was the world's greatest master of the science of deduction. As a matter of fact, he unraveled this particular problem without moving from his armchair. Hmm. I wonder how many of our listeners have learned enough of Holmes' methods to do the same. Well, I think I can make a fair stab at it, Doctor, if the clues aren't too involved, that is. Oh, no, no. All the clues are right out in plain sight, Mr. Harris. All you have to do is listen for them and make your own deductions. Oh, but uh, before we become too involved with hidden clues... Uh, Hadn't we better discuss a few clues to the secret of good grooming without straining the pocketbook? Good idea, Doctor. If you need a fine new suit for business or a good-looking sport jacket for weekend wear and really want your dollars to do double duty, here's how. Insist on Clipper Craft Clothes. Famous for stretching your dollars, for giving you positively amazing value, is the fine local independent store in your community that sells Clipper Craft. Despite rising costs of materials and manufacturing, you can still buy long-wearing, beautifully tailored Clippercraft suits for only $40 to $47.50, luxurious tropical worsteds for only $33.75 to $40, and smart sport jackets for only $26.50. It's the Clippercraft plan and the Clippercraft plan alone that makes Clippercraft clothes possible at these low prices. Concentrating the buying power of 1036 of the nation's finest stores from coast to coast, providing steady year-round operation, reducing manufacturing and distribution costs. And the savings go to you. Simply compare Clippercraft with clothes selling for many dollars more. And now, Dr. Watson, back to the adventure you think we should be able to solve for ourselves. Right, Mr. Harris. It was <clears throat> during the middle years of our joint occupancy of the lodgings in Baker Street. Holmes and I sat relaxed in two easy chairs on either side of the living, ro living room fire. Holmes' long legs stretched out in front of him. His head wreathed in the smoke from his favorite pipe, a, a horrible black, greasy old clay affair that he coddled as if it were a child. Well, we had just finished an excellent breakfast, and Holmes was in the philosophic mood that so often accompanies the process of digestion. Strange thing, life, eh, Watson? Infinitely stranger than anything the mind of man could invent. Yes, I know that's one of your pet theories, and I dare you to put it to the test. Now, take today's paper. If you, if you can find anything bizarre in that, I'll... I'll buy you a new smoking jacket. I don't want a new smoking jacket, Watson, but I'll take up your challenge. Choose any article, any paragraph at all on this page, and I'll guarantee to find something outlandish. Very well. Here. Take the very first heading. Husband's cruelty to his wife. Now, there's a half column of print about that, but I know what it's about almost without reading it. There's the other woman, the drink, the push, the blow. <laughs> no writer could invent anything more crude or commonplace. Your example, Watson, happens to be rather unfortunate. The husband was a teetotaler. There was no other woman, and the cruelty complained of was that he had the habit of winding up every meal by taking out his false teeth and hurling them at his wife, which you'll allow is an action any literary man would hardly be able to make believable. Well, maybe so, but that's just an exception. Life is made up of exceptions, Watson. There's one now, standing on the pavement on the opposite side of the street. Well, you mean that large, hebe-like young woman with the enormous boa around her neck? And the curling red feather in the hat? Yes. <laughs> well, look how she oscillates backward and forward. And the way she fidgets with her glove buttons. Oscillation on the pavement always means an affair de coeur. She would like advice, but it's not sure that the matter may not be too delicate for communication. Mm -hmm. She's de decided to take the plunge. Here she comes across the road like a swimmer leaving the bank. I say, perhaps she's been 
seriously wronged. No, Watson. In that case, the woman no longer oscillates. She pulls out the bell wire to the front door. You hear that, Watson? Decidedly fluttery. The maiden is not so much angry as perplexed and possibly grieved. Oh, but here she comes. Come in, come in. I, I hope I'm not intruding. Uh, this is Mr. Sherlock Holmes, the detective. Yes. Won't you sit down? Uh, this is my friend and colleague, Dr. Watson. Pleased to meet you. Oh, delighted. My dear young lady, don't you find that with your short sight it's a little trying to do so much typewriting? Oh, I did it first, and that's a fact. But I've got so now I know where the letters are without look... Oh. oh, but how did you know? Someone's told you about me. Oh, don't look so alarmed, my dear. That's just a bit of detection. Mr. Holmes can tell things like that by looking at you. It's uh, his way of showing off. Oh, I, I see, but... It did take me aback, your knowing things like that. It's my business to know things. I knew you used the typewriter from the appearance of your fingertips and the double line pressed into the plush above your wrists. It was equally obvious that you're nearsighted from the marks left on either side of the nose by your pince-nez. So you see, my dear Miss, uh, Miss, uh... uh my name's Sutherland, uh, Mary Sutherland. So you see, my dear Miss Sutherland, there's nothing terrifying in my conclusions. Well, no, not when you explain it like that. And now, perhaps you'll tell me why you came away to consult me in such a hurry that you managed to put on two odd shoes. Why, bless my soul, so I did. The right one's my Sunday pair. Yes, you must have been rather agitated when you left home. Yes, I did bang out of the house, and who wouldn't? It made me very angry to see the easy way Mr. Windybanks, oh, that's my father, took it all. He wouldn't go to the police. He just sat there and said there was no harm done and everything would come right in the end. So finally I got mad and told father I was coming to you myself. Uh, you say your father, but surely you mean your stepfather, since the name's not the same. Yes, he's my stepfather. Mother makes me call him father, though it sounds kind of funny, him being only five years and two months older than myself. I see. How recently did your mother marry this Mr. Windybanks? Oh, about two years ago it was, Mr. Holmes. And I'll admit I wasn't very pleased, seeing as it was so soon after father's death. And, and him a man nearly 15 years younger than herself. Enough to start complications in any home. Eh, hey, Holmes? Right. But uh, please continue, Miss Sutherland. I gather your father left your mother fairly well off. Yes, sir, he did. You see, father was a plumber in Tottenham Court Road, and he left a tidy business behind him. After he went, mother carried it on. Although I must say that William, oh, that is, uh, Mr. Hardy, father's foreman, did most of the work. And a good thing he made of it, too. This Mr. Hardy, was he your father's age? Oh, no, sir. He was just two years older than me. The fact is, we had a sort of an understanding till this year Mr. Windybanks came along. Oh, and he didn't approve of Mr. Hardy? Oh, it weren't that so much as that he didn't approve of the plumbing business. Said it wasn't high class. Oh. Uh, Mr. Windybanks is a very superior gentleman himself, Mr. Holmes. Travels in wines for West House and Marbank, the claret importers in 10 Church Street. Oh, a real top he is. I see. Uh, yes, sir. So after him and mother got married, he made us sell the business. They got £4,700 for the goodwill and the interest. But Mr. Hardy said it was practically giving it away. And so him and my stepfather had an argument. And my stepfather told Will to clear out and never darken his door again. Hmm, quite theatrical. Yes, my stepfather's like that. Well, Will says he's off to Birmingham. And will I come with him? And I says, well, I can't hardly be expected to leave me own mother. So then he gets mad and biffs off. Without giving you a chance to change your mind? Well, yes. And how is he doing in Birmingham? Very nicely, I hear. Got his own shop and all. Oh, not that I write to him. I wouldn't send him a word if I was dying, I wouldn't. Of course, serves him right for not being more persuasive. <laughs> yes, sir. Oh, but that's neither here nor there, Mr. Holmes. The fact is, I, I, I don't know why I even mentioned Will Hardy. Except that I'm so unset in my mind, my tongue kind of wags on by itself. Uh, oh, let's see here. Where was I? Your mother had just sold the plumbing business for something over 4000 You inherited part of that, I presume? Oh, no, Mr. Holmes. I've got my own money, outside of the plumbing business, that is. Oh? It was left to me by my Uncle Ned in Auckland. It's in New Zealand stock, paying me 4%. Gives me a hundred pounds a year, it does. Then the capital amounts to around two thousand five hundred pounds. Yes, sir, but I can't touch that. Just the income. Hmm, quite a tidy little amount. I believe a single lady can do very nicely on sixty pounds a year. Oh, I could do on even less than that, Mr. Holmes. I'm a good one at managing things. But so long as I live at home, I don't want to be a burden to them, so I let them have the use of it while I'm staying there. 
You mean you give the money to Mr. Windybanks? Oh, no, Mr. Holmes. I draws it out every quarter and pays it over to my mother. That's very generous of you, Miss Sutherland. Oh, it's no hardship. I, I do pretty well with what I earn at typewriting. Makes me quite self-supporting, as you might say. Yes, these independent, modern young women. Soon they'll be competing with men in business. Oh, no, sir. I'm sure I wouldn't presume to be as bold as that. Hmm. Well, to resume, we find you are a young lady very comfortably fixed. Well, I, I'm not exactly rich, Mr. Holmes, but I'd give all I have to know what's become of Mr. Hosmer Angel. Hosmer Angel, eh? Quite a romantic name. Oh, yes. And he was romantic, Mr. Holmes. Recited Browning, he did. Sounds quite devoted. Oh, yes, sir, he was. I could swear he was. And now he's gone, too. Disappeared like into thin air. And naturally, I'm, I'm anxious about him, being as it's the second time I've been left in the lurch, as you might say. I, well, I, I feel a bit sensitive about it. Of course. Had you quarreled? Oh, no, sir. We was as affectionate as two cooing doves. Mother said it used to make her quite sick to watch us. Oh, oh not that she wasn't all for Hosmer. That she was. Help me to keep it from father and all. Oh, then your father didn't know about this new admirer. No, sir. That is, not until later. And then he never really saw him. Hmm. And how did you first meet this Mr. Hosmer Angel? Uh, well, Mr. Holmes, I... Uh, I met him at the gas fitter's ball. How romantic. Oh, yes, sir, it was. The gas fitters used to send father tickets while he was alive. And afterwards, they kept on sending them to me and mother. Mr. Windybanks didn't wish us to go. He never did wish us to go anywhere. If I so much as wanted to go to a Sunday school treat, he would get quite mad about it. Rather unreasonable. Yes, sir. Well, it happened that the week of the ball, he had to go to France on business. So he wasn't there to make a scene when Mother and me went. <gasps> it was a lovely ball, Mr. Holmes. I wouldn't have missed it for anything. It, it was there I met Cosma. He was a lovely dancer. You should have seen him do the polka. Swept you quite off your feet, I've no doubt. Yes, sir. Well, he called next day to see if Mother and I got home safe the night before. And after that, I went out once or twice for walks with him. And, and things was going along as smooth as you could wish. And then Father came home and Hosmer couldn't come to the house anymore. No? No, sir. Father didn't like me to have young men come to the house. Said it didn't look well for a young girl to have followers. Hmm, rather a tyrant, eh? Oh, yes, sir. But pretty soon, he had to go off to France again for a couple of weeks. So I started walking out with Hosmer again. And this Hosmer made no attempts to see you in the meantime? No, sir. I wanted to, but Mother said she didn't think it was safe. Oh, he wrote to me every day, Hosmer did. Oh, here, I, I, I've brought the letters. I thought they might give you a clue. Quite right. We'll look them over later. Am I to take it that you and Mr. Angel had um, an understanding? Yes, sir. We were engaged after the first walk we took together. Hmm. A fast worker, eh, Holmes? <laughs> Watson, don't interrupt. What was Mr. Angel's business, Miss Sutherland? Uh, he was a cashier in an office in Leadenhall Street. What office? Oh, that's the worst of it, Mr. Holmes. I don't know. Where did he live, then? Oh, he slept on the premises. And you don't know his address? No, sir. Except that it was Leadenhall Street. Where did you address your letters? Uh, Leadenhall Street Post Office, to be left till called for. He said if they was to come to the office, he'd be ragged by the other clerks. <laughs> I offered to typewrite them like he did his, but he wouldn't have that said that when I wrote them myself, it seemed like there was something of me in them. That'll show you how fond he was of me, Mr. Holmes. He was always thinking of little things like that. Yes, quite suggestive. Can you remember any other little things about Mr. Hosmer Angel? Any little peculiarities? He was a very shy man, Mr. Holmes. He'd rather walk with me in the evening than in the daylight, because he said he liked to hold my hand. But he didn't want to be conspicuous. Very considerate and gentlemanly. Oh, yes, sir. He was a thorough gentleman with the silkiest brown beard. Even his voice was soft-like. He told me he'd had quinsy and swollen glands when he was young, and it left him with a weak throat. How unfortunate. Yes, sir. His eyes were kind of weak, too, like mine, and he wore tinted glasses against the glare. I tell you, he was about five foot five and had small hands and feet. I see. And what happened when Mr. Windybanks, your stepfather, returned to France? Well, I wrote Hosmer and he came round to the house. And he said I'd have to marry him before father came back, as he couldn't stand the separation any longer. So I asked mother and she said, why not? Every girl was entitled to her own husband. Oh, well, mother was all for Hosmer from the beginning, almost more than I was myself. So you got married? Well, no. Well, that is, 
Not quite. Oh, what happened? Well, the wedding was set for yesterday morning. Uh, we thought it best to make it a quiet ceremony. It was to be at St. Saviour's Church with a wedding breakfast afterwards at the St. Pancras Hotel. Well, about nine o'clock, Mother and me was all dressed and waiting for Hosmer. I was a bit upset, I guess. You know how a bride feels, Mr. Holmes. Oh, oh dear, I'm that nervous. I, I don't know whether I ought to get married or not. Don't you fret, Mary. All brides is like that. Why, when I was married to your father, I was so jumpy, I split both me gloves. Oh, I know, but I haven't known Hosmer very long, Mother. Maybe I oughtn't to jump off the deep end like this. What's the good of waiting, Mary? Better get married now before your father gets back. Yes, I, I suppose so. Oh, dear me, I, I wish my shoes wasn't so tight. Shh, here comes Hosmer now. Don't he look handsome with that flower in his buttonhole and all? No, you stay here, Mary. I'll answer it. A bride should act shy-like on a wedding day. Good morning, Osma. As the groom. Good morning, uh, Mother. Oh, I'm fine. Uh, hello, Mary. <laughs> hello, Osma. What's the matter? You look kind of white. Oh, I'm I'm all right. How are you? Oh, I, I'm all right too, Osma. Well, we we better be shoving off. I got a handsome waiting outside. Oh, but Hosmer, it's such a little way, and handsome's is expensive. Oh, you don't think that any bride of mine is going to walk on her wedding day? Now, who can that be? Hosmer, you're as full of jumps as a kangaroo. Now I'll go. What is it? <gasps> telegram? Oh, thank you. It's a telegram. M maybe somebody's died. I'm almost afraid to look. Well, here, let me. I'm uh, used to these things. Expect me home today. Erasmus G. Windybanks. Father! Father's coming home. What if he gets here before... Now, <laughs> don't lose your nerve. You're of age, remember, so it don't matter how he raves afterwards. Oh, Mary, promise you won't let him uh, tear us apart. No, no. Swear it, Mary. Now, where's the Bible? Mary's carrying mine, the one I got married with. Both times. All right. Now, put your left hand on that Bible and swear that whatever happens, you will always be true to me and to me only. But, but what could happen? Oh, you never know. Now, swear it, Mary, for my sake. Swear it. Yes, Mary. Why not do as Osmer asks? All right. I, I, I swear. Oh, good. Now then, let's get on with it. Yes, Osmer. Oh, dear. Is my bonnet on straight? Yes, yes. Only hurry. Mr. Windybanks may get back any minute. Mary, don't forget your flowers. No, Mother. Well, hurry, hurry. Now, here's the cab. You first, uh, Mother. Now, easy, don't upset the cab. Now, Mary, that's right. Aren't you coming too, Hosmer? Uh, no, there isn't room. I'd must your dress. Uh, I I'll hail another cab. Oh, yes, there's a four-wheeler now. Hey, cabby! Now, you go on. I'll follow after. See you at the church, Hosmer. A St. Saviour's driver. Yes, Osma got the other cab. It's foreign us. Oh, my, my knees are knocking together like anything. Now, hush up, Mary. Anyone would think you didn't want to get married. Well, maybe I do, and maybe I don't. Well, just hold your breath, and it'll be over in no time now. Here's the church. You get out first and mind your dress. That's it. Now, now, help me. Here, not so fast. I'm no blinking acrobat. That's it. Here you are, cabby. Oh, here comes Hosmer's four-wheeler now. Yes, she saviors like you asked for. What? Why doesn't he get out? Give him time. Maybe his knees is shaky, too. Come on, sir. What ails the man? Mother! Something's wrong with Hosmer. Oh, stuff. I I'm going to see. Wake up there. I I'll speak to him, cabby. I what? The cab's empty. What? Something's happened to Hosmer. He's gone and left me waiting at the church. <laughs> Every day is value day when you insist on clothes by Clippercraft. Yes, we have to know our values are really great when we suggest you compare Clippercraft 
with clothes selling for very much more, which is exactly what we do suggest. Because there's a great big idea behind Clippercraft clothes in the form of the famous Clippercraft plan. You get the benefit of great savings made by concentrating the buying power of 1036 of the nation's finest stores from coast to coast. Yes, the Clippercraft plan really streamlines the fine old craft of clothes making. When you can get such remarkably fine quality in suits for only 40 to 4750, in tropical worsteds for only 3375 to 40 dollars, and in sport jackets for only 2650, why pay more? For selling expensive clothes at inexpensive low prices at the nation's finest stores is the great big idea behind the Clippercraft plan. That's why men who know insist on Clippercraft clothes. So be sure to visit the Clippercraft store in your city. These leading stores in the metropolitan area are proud to add their names to Clippercraft in your suits, top coats, sport jackets, and tropicals. In Manhattan, Saks 34th, Broadway at 34th. John Wanamaker Men's Stores, Broadway at 8th and 67 Liberty Street. In Brooklyn, Abraham and Strauss. In Newark, New Jersey, Boulevard Men's Shop, Kresge, Newark. And in Jamaica, the B&B &B Clothes Shop, 16408 Jamaica Avenue. And now back to Baker Street, where we find Dr. Watson commiserating with the young lady who has been left waiting at the church. A shameful way for any gentleman to act, deserting his bride at the altar. Oh, no, Dr. Watson, I'm sure he didn't do that. Not on purpose, that is. He was too kind for that. And then there's that pledge I gave him. Oh, you think he foresaw some unforeseen danger, and that's why he made you take the oath? Yes, sir. Have you any notion what it could have been? No, sir. How did your father take it? I presume he found out. Oh, yes, sir. He was quite consoling, really. Remarkable. Oh, it drives me half mad to think of it, Mr. Holmes. It's not as if it was the first time I'd been disappointed. I understand. I shall be delighted to glance into the matter for you, Miss Sutherland. Now, let me advise you to turn the whole matter over to me and don't let your mind dwell on it any further. Above all, try to let Mr. Hosmer Angel vanish from your memory as he's done from your life. Then you, you, you don't think I'll ever see him again? I'm afraid not. Oh, dearie me. <laughs> You've been very kind, Mr. Holmes, I'm sure. I, I don't know how to thank you. Not at all, Miss Sutherland. Well, good day, gentlemen. Oh. Where's my hanky? Oh, here it is. Oh, dearie me. Another romance blighted. Holmes, what a horrid mess of bottles and test tubes. Yes, smells of hydrochloric acid. Marvellous, my dear Watson, marvellous. I don't believe you've budged out of this room since that poor young lady left early this morning. No, it wasn't necessary. Then you've solved it? Certainly. It was bisulfate of baritone. No, I mean the mystery of the disappearing bridegroom. Oh, that. There never was any mystery in that affair, Watson. Pretty self-evident, don't you think? Oh, no, can't say I do. Oh, really? But I let you look at Mr. Hosmer's love letters. But they were typewritten, even to the signature. Yes, that's what's really suggestive. Mm. Now, what's that? Mr. Windybanks, I fancy. Well, you mean the girl's father, uh, stepfather? Quite. I sent off a note to him this morning to his place of business. But I must say, who And you... this afternoon, I received this business-like reply on West House and Marbank stationery, saying he'd be here at six o'clock. Come in, come in. Ah, Mr. Windybanks. Yes, Mr. Holmes. This typewritten note was from you, on which you set the time for this appointment at six o'clock? Yes, Mr. Holmes. Uh, I'm afraid I'm a trifle late. It's about Miss Sutherland's missing suitor, eh? Quite. Uh, I'm sorry she's troubled you, Mr. Holmes. But you know what young girls are. Besides, it's a useless expense. Because how in the name of this and that can you expect to locate Hosmer Angel? Uh, pardon me if I disagree with you, Mr. Windybanks, but I have every reason to believe that I have located Mr. Hosmer Angel. Uh, uh oh. Ah, delighted, Mr. Holmes, delighted. Yes. I wonder if anyone's ever told you that a typewriter has really quite as much individuality as a man's handwriting. Oh, you don't say. Oh, but I most emphatically do. Every typewriter develops its own little idiosyncrasies. Now, this note of yours, Mr. Windybanks, you'll notice that all the E's are slightly slurred and there's a slight defect in the tail of the R. Yes, yes, I never noticed it before. Hmm, obviously. 
Now, I have here four letters which purport to come from the missing man. In all of them, the E's are slurred and the R's tailless. Well, uh, I didn't come here to waste time with fantastic talk like this. If you're going to catch the man, catch him. And let me know when you succeed. Certainly. Watson, be good enough to lock the door. With pleasure. Now then, Mr. Windybanks, I have caught Mr. Hosmer Angel. Because you yourself are that gentleman. But I... Well, 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 what if I am? I didn't marry the girl, did I? It's, uh, it's not actionable. No, your conduct is even worse than that. It's dishonorable and degrading. In the first place, you're the sort of scoundrel who marries an older woman for her money. Not satisfied, you want to assure yourself of the daughter's income, which you'll lose if she marries. You make her break off with her first sweetheart. And when you see it's going to be impossible to keep others from falling in love with her, you arrange to do so yourself. Well, it, well, it was only a joke at first. I failed to see any humor in it. Well, I, I didn't know she'd fall for me like that, did I? You made the girl swear she'd be true and wait for you. And then you played the cad and disappeared. Well, maybe so, and maybe not. But I'm not breaking any laws. And as long as you keep that door locked... Quite so. Should you care to call a policeman? There's one in the street below. I'm sure your employer, Mr. Merrill Marbanks, who, by the way, is an old friend of mine, will be very interested in your little joke. Oh, no, 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 Mr. Holmes. You, you couldn't tell him. I, I'd lose my job and my, my, my social standing. Quite so. I'll keep quiet on one condition. Oh, yes, sir, yes, sir. Anything at all. You are not to discourage any more of Miss Mary's suitors, past, present, or future. Oh, oh, no, Mr. Holmes. I wouldn't think of it. It was all just a little game, you see. Yes. Well, the game's over. Watson, you may show the gentleman out. Right. Now then. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, good day, gentlemen. I hope you won't hold any hard feelings, Mr. Holmes. And if you ever... Come need... along, no loitering, or I'll boot you downstairs. I'm a good man to do it anyway. Well, I'm going. I'm going. You filthy blackguard. I... I see, but I... I still don't see how you spotted the man. That typewritten letter, Watson, particularly the signature. Obviously, the man wanted to disguise his handwriting, which would have been familiar to the girl. Well, whose handwriting would have been familiar to her? Answer, the father's, as he was the only man she was allowed to come in contact with. Well, it's really quite simple when you explain it. Oh, by the way, are, are you going to tell the girl? I? <laughs> no, heaven forbid. I shall let Mr. Will Hardy of Birmingham have that privilege. I wrote him the facts of the case this morning. No, he'll be able to persuade her to believe it. I never could. Holmes, you're a moral coward. Perhaps, Watson. You remember the old Persian saying... There's danger for him who taketh the cub of the tiger, and danger also for whoso snatches a delusion from a woman. Now then, Mr. Harris, did you guess the solution? Well, when Holmes began to talk about typewriters, I started to have an inkling, Doctor. But before that, I'll admit I was pretty much at sea. Why, Mr. Harris, I'm surprised. And after all my teaching... <laughs> well, how about giving us a hint about next week's story, Dr. Watson? Yes, Mr. Harris. Uh, next week, I think I'll tell you about a particularly complicated case of violent and untimely death that Holmes and I ran across on what started out to be... An uneventful excursion up the Thames. I call it the complicated poisoning on Eel Pie Island. The makers of Clipper Craft Clothes and 1036 leading stores from coast to coast have brought you another in the new series of broadcasts featuring the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Our stories are based upon the character Sherlock Holmes, created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Sherlock Holmes is played by John Stanley, Dr. Watson by Alfred Shirley, and the dramatizations are by Edith Miser. Sherlock Holmes is produced and directed by Basil Lochran with special music by Albert Berman. If you don't know your Clippercraft dealer, write Clippercraft, 200 Fifth Avenue, New York City. Be sure to listen next week to Sherlock Holmes in The Complicated Poisoning on Eel Pie Island. <laughs> this is Cy Harris speaking for Clippercraft Clothes. This is the network for the Indianapolis Speedway races on Monday, the Mutual Broadcasting System. <laughs>